it's just kind of one of those wild factors. So if you haven't picked up on it yet, February's theme is creativity and resilient imagination. And then as we have a sub focus theme as well, where you have one of the principles every month. So it's the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and society at large. So last Thursday night, we had a movie discussion, the monthly movie discussion. And the movie I chose, it was a documentary actually called Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry. And it's about the famous Chinese artist Ai Weiwei. And to me, I chose it because it's this perfect confluence of creativity and resilient imagination and the fifth principle. So you're probably sitting there going, what did he say? Ai Weiwei what? So let me tell you who Ai Weiwei is. Ai Weiwei, remember the 2008 Beijing Olympics and their Olympic stadium that looked like a bird's nest? Well, he was the designer of it. And that's a picture of him right there. And there's the images of it by daylight. And then at night when they had those incredible fireworks and all the illumination from within. So he's a very important artist in Chinese society and very, very extraordinarily creative. So the documentary really focused on um, the last decade of his life, if you will. Now, at the same time that the Olympics were going on in 2008, or in the same year, rather, there was an earthquake. Do you remember the 2008 earthquake in Xishan, China? And thousands of school children died because their schools instantly collapsed when the earthquake started. And it's the type of thing that shouldn't have happened because there are earthquake prone areas, everyone knows that, and they are supposed to build them to standards that can withstand most earthquakes. But because of the very shoddy construction that was caused by government corruption, thousands of children died while they were in their classrooms. Now, the interesting thing about China society is they didn't go and find the name or publish the names of the children that were dead. They kind of like swept it under the rug and Ai Weiwei wanted to do something about it. So he and his staff followed up with as many families as they could who lost a child and recorded their names and created a sort of a memorial for it that was um, a, a verbal memorial that they did um, at one time. But then he went on to create something even bigger. So this is an artwork that he did. He does things on a massive scale and this is called remembering. And it wasn't in China because, of course, this would be embarrassing to the Chinese government. So it was in Munich at the Haus der Kunst or the Art Museum. And look at that vast expanse there. I couldn't find something that exactly told me, but I'm pretty sure that that is the Chinese characters for the word remembering. If someone else knows, please let me know. But he built this massive sculpture um, to piece of art to the children who lost their lives. And you can see him, he's very excited there. Now, the really interesting thing about this is over, look in the lower right-hand corner, the entire thing is built out of 9,000 children's backpacks to make a statement that we remember these children who lost their lives needlessly. Ai Weiwei's comment is a natural disaster is a public matter. And therefore he created, uses his talent, and his creative imagination to build this kind of art. Now Ai Weiwei had a very tough start in life. His father was a very famous poet and writer and very much pushed the concept of individualism in Chinese society, which in communist Chinese society is the exact opposite of pushing for individualism. So he was banned to a work camp for 20 years. And Ai Weiwei was actually born in the work camp and lived in that work camp in the beginning. But yet he came out of that with such a creative spark and energy to do something about helping to make China better. And it didn't say it in the documentary, but I'm pretty sure that resiliency comes from the art that he does. He's just, everything he touches is creative. He cannot do creative things. And I think that really has led to his resiliency to be able to do this kind of stuff in a society that is so repressive.
little transition there. So, as I said, the, the title for this sermon today is the um, creativity of um, resilient imagination. And why did I call it a gift of creative imagination? Because creative imagination, to me, is like our own private vitamin supplement to help boost our resilience. Creative imagination is one of those things that we can give ourselves. No one can take it away. It's always there. Some of us are maybe more creative and have stronger imaginations than others, but we're all born with it and have it. So today I thought I'd do a little um, background on it and where do we come up with this and how should we think about it? So I looked up some research. There's an article called Authentic Happiness that was published by the University of Pennsylvania. And it's published by researchers and there's a couple parts of the article that caught my attention. One is on motivation and creativity and one is on creativity and well-being. So motivation and creativity, they said, what benefit do creative types seek? And what they discovered is those that are the most creative, those that have the most original ideas are intrinsically motivated, meaning it's just this inner drive to share their creativity is what makes them so creative. They don't care about being paid. They don't care about the awards they might get or the recognition or public fame. It's just the, they can, they're free, frankly, to create as they want. And so they're just extremely motivated to put it out there. And then they also said there's a small amount of research that they've started that suggests there's also this pro-social motivation, which perhaps is a little bit more why Ai Weiwei comes from. And it's this desire to contribute to the lives of others, either through creating beauty or, in his case, a political statement. And then there's creativity and well-being. The researchers said that in past research, there's a ton of it that connects creative activities and therapeutic benefits that ultimately lead to enhanced well-being and therefore resilience. So that seems to be very well established. But they're doing current research to see if creative thinking also leads to enhanced cognitive flexibility and greater problem solving skills. And that makes sense. If you're a creative, if you've got a well honed creative imagination, you have problems that come to you and you can look at it from many angles and, and really um, work on some sort of creative solution. But they said because you've learned how to do that, you have this important sense of mastery and agency. And so in times of adversity, instead of giving up, instead of maybe falling into a depression and not knowing what to do and being bewildered, these creative types actually look at the adversity as an opportunity. They see it as an opportunity to creatively make their way through it. Kind of the creative problem solving, like we saw in the, in the story of the of the bears and the honey pots and the helicopters on the power lines in Canada. So this, all this research to summarize is really about creative imagination and how it reports, uh, supports resiliency. But the thing of it is they were all talking about imagination in our heads. It's a very cerebral kind of activity. So there's another writer, the writer, adventurer, creative, um, advocate Joni Sensel has a blog, The Creative Mind, and she had an article that said, the embodiment of your imagination, how peak creativity requires your heart and your body. Now this went into the history of imagination and creativity. And she said that until 500 years ago, so think about that, until 500 years ago, it was believed that our imagination was controlled by the supernatural. So either you're somebody like Muhammad or Moses, where God is telling you all these things and, and you write it all down, or you're one of the oracles up on a mountaintop in Greece, or they said it was controlled by demons. So there was always a lot of people that were assumed to be possessed by demons. So this whole idea of imagination was not really a human thing. It was just a, a vessel within ourselves that some supernatural being filled right? Well, then they also thought that that was a critical mark of critical thinking. So imagination was required for critical thinking to be human. 
So that set apart humans from animals who really only had reactionary base instincts. The interesting thing I found in the article too is that imagination was often attributed to different organs. They didn't know where imagination came from. And so there's references that we still use today that come from this way of thinking. So for example, the heart. And people will say, put your heart into it. Or what is your heart telling you? Or your liver. We don't really use this phrase, but it said cowardly folks were called lily livered, and that's where that comes from. Or gut, trust your gut. Plato believed that the imagination and creativity came from somewhere in your, your gut, your intestines, your spleen, somewhere down there. And we still have the expression that's used all the time, trust your gut, go with your feelings in your gut. She also says that creativity requires dedication. You get the spark of idea, but to really turn it into something requires sticking with it, which is where we come up with expressions again, strong stomach, girded loins, nerves of steel. So Sensi argues we should keep some of these concepts, even if they aren't scientifically true. She believes that imagination is integrative. Creative imagination often requires us to get out of our heads and into our bodies as well. And here's a quote that she says, most of the latest research indicates that creativity flourishes when a period of determined preparation is followed by a break in which the brain can freely make new connections among the raw materials it's stored. That's the time she says to go out for a walk, to take a hot shower, to whack at weeds in the garden, or engage in whatever similar activity does it for you. It's then when our bodies are mildly occupied and our minds can wander that those eureka moments come, unquote. And I'm a true believer. Often when I'm creating a sermon or some sort of activity that really requires intense imagination, I come to a roadblock and I usually take a 20 minute nap or I'll go for a swim or even washing the dishes and after it, I come back with, I know what I want to do. So Sensi closes her article with this quote, a brain in a jar might still have ideas, but we wouldn't do much with them. Give due credit to your imagination supporting organs to better realize your creative potential. So I've given you some scientific research that's very cerebral about creativity. I've given you some, a speaker that wants you to be more integrated about your creativity, but there's actually a theological grounding for creative imagination and it's very Unitarian. Look at our first source. I've dubbed it always the wonder of transcendentalism, but the first source says this, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Unitarian Universalists believe that creative imagination is just one way we could describe the divine, the holy, the spiritual. And it all dates back to transcendentalism, a big movement in the early 19th century that involved a lot of Unitarians particularly Ralph Waldo Emerson and his essay, Nature. In that essay, he says, the divine is not something abstract or hidden or confined to historic documents or scriptures or a church or an altar or a box somewhere. The divine, he says, is everywhere in nature. In fact, his name for nature was universal being. Nature, he said, nature, the human soul and divine are actually one. And transcendence happens when someone becomes one with nature and the divine. Okay, so what does this have to do with creativity and resilient imagination? Well, in his essay, in the third chapter, he focuses on beauty. Emerson believed that after the basic needs were met by humans, we have this fundamental requirement for beauty that without beauty in our life, we can't have well-being or resilience. Now, Emerson 
presents three properties of natural beauty. And I really, I'll just share the first and third one with you. The first one is that he believed that nature restores and gives simple pleasure to us. It invigorates and provides a sense of well-being. And he's careful to say it doesn't have to be just this idyllic 80 degree day with blue skies and no mosquitoes. He says, quote, nature pleases even in its harsher moments. Unquote. So think of this week. Think of all the snow and ice and beauty that created. I, I mean, my Facebook and Instagram feeds were flooded with pictures, and many from you all, taking just these stunning photos. And I reached out to Susan Schwartz and I asked her for some photos for my opening words this morning of that same phenomenon. But you know it's fleeting, right? That's what we have today. The sun will come out, it will warm, it, things will melt. And then we are awed right now by nature's power to cover everything evenly in this glistening white and how it even weighed down mighty trees. But we'll marvel at it as well in the spring when the buds and the flowers come out. And then in the summer when the deep green foliage and tall grasses and fruits are everywhere. And of course, again in the fall when it bursts forth in all these colors. Emerson says we're naturally drawn to nature to fulfill our need for beauty. It reinforces our sense of well-being and sparks creativity. And just like Sensi in her article, Emerson cautions that we can't merely experience this ultimate being of nature with our conscious mind, but we have to immerse ourselves into it. And he goes on to describe his really poetic phrases of when he's transcended into nature. He was caught up in the wonder and the awe of it all. And we also need to be mindful, infinitely always mindful of the natural scenes around us, Emerson said, because it's impermanent, just like the images of the OK Go, the one moment video we just reviewed. His second principle, just so you know, was that nature pumps us up. He says, quote, nature works together with the spiritual elements in man to enhance the nobility of virtuous and heroic human actions. Now, what, maybe that's true for Emerson, but it wasn't really germane to what I wanted to talk about today. So to the third point, nature helps us to grasp the divine order of the universe and stimulates our intellect and creativity. He says, we see nature in the mind's eye and nature is what causes us to express it in creativity and art. So creativity and resilient imagination. I've given you a great example of Ai Weiwei, Ai Weiwei's art, the science of creativity, Sensi's embodiment of creativity, and Emerson's theology of wonder and creativity through nature. So now, my encouragement is for you to engage in it, right? So on the 21st, two weeks from now, we're gonna have a celebration of our creativity and imaginations and show how we've been resilient through the pandemic. It's almost the year anniversary from when this started. And I wanted to take an opportunity and I've asked you to send me via email, photos or short recordings and descriptions of how what I'm looking at has been your creative outlet and your way to be resilient and provide sustenance for yourself. Now, if you don't think of yourself as the creative type, hopefully what I've provided today is enough encouragement to try it. Try it this next week, anything. You can creatively cook, for heaven's sakes, something you've got around the house and just send me a picture of it. And the, everything's due on um, February 15th, so a week from tomorrow. So please, I wanna have a great celebration of all of our creativity for that service. And tied with that today, I'm going to give you the breakout question.